I'd like to tell you a story. While this story is not necessarily about all of us, this story affects all of us. This is the story of the rebirth of civilization. I don't want to say birth exactly of civilization because we have almost no real quantifiable evidence on when that actually happened, just a smattering of ancient cryptic sites and similar global creation myths, but after combing manuscripts, pictures, ancient histories, and myths, I believe I have a pretty thorough, albeit rough draft, idea of how we restarted our civilizations after Mother Nature laid us low. Since it's fairly well known that humans are a species with amnesia, the point of this series is to try to remember again how the human population progressed prior to the fall of the Roman Empire. As a caveat, like I said, in some places I'm going to be wrong, but I've tried to eliminate as many assumptions as I could and take it nothing at face value. I've actually spent days researching single claims, such as the hole in the back of the Sphinx. This is part one. Skulls were found in Morocco in 1961 with flat faces and elongated craniums at a site in Jebel Irhud. Initially overlooked, the skulls and site were reinvestigated in the early 21st century, and a date of 300,000 years hence was given these and other fossils found in the same area. What this represents is a modern human face on an archaic elongated skull dating from 100,000 years before the previous modern human face and more rounded human skulls found on the more southern eastern side of Africa. To put this into perspective, the out of Africa theory puts humans in Ethiopia and further south at this time in history. Accordingly, we, humans, migrated north and out of Africa during the periods of time when the Sahara wasn't a desert wasteland and was lush. Now, I agree and disagree with this assessment, largely because of the characteristics of dating of the Moroccan skulls. One fallacy I find a lot of the time regarding archaic human evolution is this idea that all discoveries should be chronologically consistent. That is to say, according to the Out of Africa theory, there should be human remains discovered and dated in chronological order spreading from the Great Rift Valley, northward out of Africa, up into Mongolia, then spreading out to the four corners of the world. A few years ago on a bus trip from Thailand to Burma to pass the time, I watched Dr. Spencer Wells' exceptional documentary on mitochondrial DNA called Journey of Man link is in the description. When he followed the matrilineal line of the DNA trail, he was able to prove some aspects of this theory to be fairly accurate. The problem that I have with this theory, however, is that it presupposes a very linear progression, with no branching at any point into separate, disparate evolutionary trees. The skull from Morocco, however, seems to call into question this linear progression, hinting at perhaps distinct, likely even isolated, homo sapien populations dating to even before the out of africa theory even puts us in north africa remember that the out of africa theory states that as sahara became lush humans or our predecessors traveled north when it wasn't a desert then the sahara would desert up again we would do some separate evolving it would green up we'd head north again rinse and repeat several times so let's assume this part of the theory is accurate and we homos did skadoodle out of africa every time the sahara wasn't a death trap what would happen if one of those groups didn't go all the way out and instead hung out in Northwest Africa, where it never really desertified completely? Is it outside the realm of possibility that this branch of our family would experience unusual evolution, as can be seen in the Moroccan skulls? Consider the unusual case of Homo floresiensis. Called the Hobbit, these hominids existed on the island of Flores up to about 50,000 years ago and were only about three feet tall when fully grown. They likely were the result of a phenomenon called island dwarfism, in which a species, over time, adapts to new environments by changing to fill open niches. This is a unique feature of evolution on islands because they are isolated from other species' migration, and so are able to adapt specifically to new environments to occupy and exploit otherwise already filled niches. This results in some species shrinking, as in the case of the hobbits and elephants, also found on the island of Flores, or in some species enlarging, like the giant rats of Flores or the giant marabou stork, a six-foot predatory bird. Who would want to live in a neighborhood like that? Fucking six-foot pigeons walking around. <laughs> Another example is the Fusa of Madagascar, which looks and acts like a cat with a dog's snout. In actuality, it's a relative of the mongoose, but has evolved features, hunting, and even nurturing behavior of cats to fill an open niche on Madagascar, an island with no relatives of the cat family. Is it outside the realm of possibility that the same phenomenon could happen to an isolated population on an island of green surrounded by a sea of sand? This would account for the unusual shape seen in the Moroccan skulls as compared to what we consider anatomically modern humans. Morocco is, after all, very close to Portugal. 
where the earliest likely proto-Neanderthal skulls have been found. 400,000 years ago in Portugal, 300,000 years ago in Morocco, etc. So let's assume, during one of the earliest migrations out of Africa, a cousin of both Neanderthal and modern humans got isolated in northern Morocco, protected by the Atlas Mountains to the south, the oceans to the north, and provided ample foodstuffs from the lush vegetation and waterways present in that area during the late Pleistocene period. Or let's even go so far as to say a predecessor of modern humans got isolated and then intermingled with the predecessor of Neanderthals, resulting in a Neanderthalish Homo sapiens south of the Strait of Gibraltar and a Neanderthalish Neanderthal north of the Strait. Either way, the overall point here is that this niche in Northwest Africa was isolated, protected, and supplied with resources, and now we have evidence that a weird crossbreed made it a home. It seems reasonable that humans not only didn't follow one goat path north from the Great Rift Valley out of Africa and off into Europe, Asia, and North America, as the prevailing wisdom goes, but likely also stopped along various paths, creating new, distinct pseudo-human populations. With that in mind, let's examine the Moroccan skulls in a little bit more detail. We can clearly see the Homo sapien face with, basically, a Neanderthal skull. Despite the assumption by some researchers that they found an even older first iteration of anatomically modern humans, this leads me to conclude that the Morocco skull is not, in fact, our first modern ancestor. I've come to this conclusion because of a principle called plexiomorphy. Essentially, and I'm going to way oversimplify this, a bony fish and a shark both have gills. A whale does not. Therefore, one can conclude that bony fish and sharks are more closely related than bony fish and whales. This, however, is a fallacy, since bony fish evolved into land dwellers, who then evolved back into water-dwelling whales. Whales, therefore, are essentially great-grandchildren of bony fish, whereas sharks simply shared a common ancestor of fish that had gills and have since went their own dramatic biological way. I think the skulls found at Jebel Irhud in Morocco represent the same principle. I come to this conclusion because let's not forget that the earliest proto-Neanderthal skulls date from 400,000 years ago plus in Portugal, which is again a stone's throw away from Morocco, where skulls with half Neanderthal, half human features have been found 100,000 years older than the first anatomically modern human skulls found pretty much a continent away. Now I've been unable to find any information on DNA analysis of the Jebel Irhud skulls, but I'd be willing to bet that there's a higher percentage of Neanderthal DNA in them than is found in other archaic hominids. I'm sure it's just a matter of time, as they've actually been able to get DNA out of older remains, it's just dependent on how well the specimens are preserved. So, follow my logic here. One migration out of Africa before 300,000 years ago ends up in Morocco. For whatever reason, they have Homo sapien faces with Neanderthal long skulls. If they don't interact again with anato anatomically modern humans, which seems likely given the geographical barriers, Atlas Mountains, Mediterranean Sea, Atlantic Ocean, Sahara Desert, etc. They are on their own for evolution. As we've seen in island evolutions, they would morph to fill an available niche. There would be little reason for a brain case shift 100,000 years later to the bulbous heads see in ancient yet anatomically modern humans across the continent of Africa. A decent swath of the ancient human science technology sees the Jebel Irhud skulls as just a transitional form. And I can't really argue with that. But I do argue with the idea that this transitional form is linearly connected to humans because of the head shape. I don't think it's logical or in line with evolutionary biology that we would go from bulbous skulls to long skulls back to bulbous. This is the skull of Homo heidelbergensis, the believed shared ancestor of modern anatomical humans and Neanderthals. This particular one is dated to 400,000 years ago and came from Cima de los Foyesos in Spain. There are some examples that have slightly more elongated skulls, but most are, are very bulbous like this one, and all of them are far more bulbous than Neanderthal skulls. This is the skull of a Neanderthal. Look at that chin and that long cerebellum stretched head. Remember the cerebrum is in the front, cerebellum is in the back. This is a skull found in Ethiopia that used to be thought of as a first example of anatomically modern humans. It dates to about 200,000 years ago. And this is the skull from Jebu Irhud. Again, dates to 300,000 years ago. If this really was a precursor to modern humans, why or how would we have gone bulbous, a la Heidelbergensis, to elongated, Jebel, back to bulbous, Homo from Ethiopia? It seems more likely that this was a variant strain of human. Face of anatomically modern human, long skull of Neanderthal. That is not to say that this branch were actually caused by a coupling of Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. 
humans. That's one possibility, of course, but it's also possible that a common ancestor of Neanderthals and of the Jebel Irhud skulls existed if these two branches just went their own way over time and distance. One way to figure out which case is more likely would be to compare the brain capacity, weights, and skull size, etc. But like DNA analysis, I can't seem to find any relative information on the internet about the exact measurements of the Jebel Irhud skulls, except for a paper by Emiliano Bruner and uh, Oz. Osborn Pearson, who states, The Indocast maximum width is large when compared with the hemispheric length, with values similar to those of Neanderthals. Conversely, the frontal width is less pronounced, showing proportions compatible with modern and non-modern human taxa. The vertical proportions are similar to those displayed by Homo erectus, while the lateral proportions are comparable to Neanderthals. Furthermore, the upper parietal areas showed a certain parasagittal lateral bulging, as in European Neanderthals. It remains to be established if this trait evolved independently in both the Neanderthal and modern human lineages, or if it was already present in a common ancestor of these two groups. If you have a link or relative information on the hard numbers for the capacity, weight, etc. of the Jebel Earhood skulls, please leave a comment. I really need that info as it would either completely disprove my theory or actually add weight to it. Unintended. So, as the researchers suggest, the skulls have Neanderthal measurements more so than they do anatomically modern humans. This is a comparison of a Neanderthal skull on the right and an atomically modern human skull on the left. Look at the size difference. Neanderthals, however, were shorter than modern humans. However, they were much more bulky. These adaptations are believed to be in response to cold climates. However, this doesn't really account for the brain size difference. The bottom line is that Neanderthals had bigger brains, thicker bodies, but shorter limbs. If the Moroccan skulls from Jebu Irhud are Neanderthal sized, but the bearers of those skulls never encountered the same cold climates that Neanderthals did, and instead retain the taller stature of African proto-humans, perhaps their descendants were, essentially, just very large, anatomically modern-looking hominids with long heads. Now, as we move forward, keep this distinct population from Northwest Africa with long heads in the back of your skull, because it becomes incredibly interesting and relevant as we progress down the ages. So, to quickly recap, let's assume in Northwest Africa, in the areas along the coast where the Sahara never fully desertified, an isolated population of elongated Neanderthal skull-sized hominids found a home 300,000 years ago. In part two of this series, I'm going to start walking down the path of how we went from there, Northwest Africa, circa Middle Pleistocene, to here, 21st century internet culture. Thank you for watching this first installment, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Flawlessly logical. Subscribe, motherfucker. I am the one, the one, yes, I don't need a gun.